I'm Dave Fleming, Senior Leader at Aldea Spiritual Community. Today you've arrived at another in our series on Stoicism. More than a stiff upper lip, what is Stoicism and why does it matter in our life? And we're delighted today to have a conversation with Nancy Sherman. Nancy is Distinguished University Professor and Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown University, where she has taught since 1989. She has affiliate appointments with Georgetown Law Center on National Security and the Law and the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. From 1997 to 1999, she served as inaugural holder of the Distinguished Chair in Ethics at the U.S. Naval Academy, helping to design and teach the brigade-wide military ethics course and lay the groundwork for the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership at the Naval Academy. She's an expert in ethics, the history of moral philosophy, moral psychology, military ethics, and emotions. She's a New York Times notable author with a number of books uh, to her credit, including the one we're going to talk about today, Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. Sherman received a BA magna cum laude with honors from Bryn Mawr College and her PhD from Harvard, where she received the George Plimpton Adam Prize for the most distinguished dissertation in the area of the history of philosophy. She also holds a Master of Literature from the University of Edinburgh. She was an assistant and associate professor at Yale before joining the faculty at Georgetown. Sherman has research training in psychoanalysis from the Washington Psycho Psychoanalytic Institute and is a frequent contributor to the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, and other media outlets. We're so delighted that Nancy is with us today to talk about Stoicism, what it is, uh, why it should matter to us. And that's right where we start the conversation. And then we traverse a number of topics in her book that I believe can be extremely helpful to your own pursuit of wisdom and meaning and spirituality. Uh, she also talks a bit about her own life and her experience working with both military cadets and uh, officers from around uh, the different military branches and what she has learned by serving them uh, in the area of ethics and morality. If you're joining us for the first time today, we're delighted that you're here. On the page where you're watching this is more information about Nancy, as well as a reflective guide that you can use after you watch the main uh, podcast. And today you're going to really want to watch the aftercast because Nancy and I go for about 50, 55 minutes, and it is really worth watching or listening to all of it. Of course, there's also a meditation that you can use now and in the future for your own um, edification, your own uh, calming of yourself to ready yourself for today or any time this week or beyond. The reflective guide allows you to take some of the things that Nancy and I talked about and reflect on your own or bring a group together, have them watch uh, the, the video or listen to the, the uh, audio podcast and then come together with the reflective guide and use it as an on-ramp into your own conversations. If you're new to us, we're glad you're here. If you're part of our com uh, community, we're delighted that you've joined us today. As always, we thrive because of the generosity of our community. You can give to our endeavor at loveperiod.org. We're so uh, delighted that you're here, that you're ready to learn about how stoicism can bring wisdom into your life. So I'm delighted to bring you Nancy Sherman. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. It's delightful to have you. I really appreciate your time. My great pleasure. Thank you so much. Dave. Absolutely. I've got lots of different 
topics I'd really like to explore from your book, Stoic Wisdom. There it is behind you. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, but to start, I'd like to ask you this question. I want you to imagine that you're on a plane and you've been flying across the country for oh, four, four and a half hours and you're just starting to descend. And the woman next to you is sort of putting things away for the descent from her bag and out falls your book, your new book. Yes, exactly. And <laughs> she, sort of, she, she picks it up and sort of holds it like maybe, well, this is something maybe I'll start on the descent. And I don't know if your picture's in the book, but let's imagine that it is. And okay, and so she looks at the back cover and realizes it's you sitting next to her. And so she closes the book and looks at you and says, well, I'm really looking forward to your book, but just in a couple of minutes on the descent, under five, could you tell me, Nancy, what stoicism is and why I should care about it? Oh, how, would you, how would you respond to that? Great question. I'll have to remember that, uh, that way of going. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dave. So uh, some of that has happened before I have to I say. bet it has. <laughs> so um, I guess I would, uh, let me begin this way. I would say, you know, there's a lot of chatter out there about stoicism, about it being emotionless, about uh, being um, apathetic or at least indifferent to the external world. And also about a kind of tough macho grit uh, sort of uh, philosophy. Uh, suck it up and truck on if you're in the military might be the way you'd put it. Mm. Um, and as someone who's studied the ancients for most of my uh, career and the Stoics in particular, uh, that's not how I read the Stoics. So the book is a, a correction of the distortion. And the distortion about the emotions uh, is this, that, yeah, there are a lot of emotions that, are, um, that catch us off guard and that run away from us and are irrational. Uh, they overleap reason or outleap reason, the Stoics would say. We should manage them uh, and figure out how to manage them. But the Stoics always believed that there were multi-layers of emotions and that some of them were fast and furious and a bit like arousals mm. um, of all kinds, you know, some of which do us well and are adaptive. If you didn't run away from the bear or, or figure out you have to freeze, um, you wouldn't be alive. You know, some of them are really evolutionarily useful. Others aren't so much that if they're fil filtered with too much bias and you react in ways that never saw slow thinking, as Daniel Kahneman might put it. They're all fast thinking and they're never monitored by effortful um, slow thinking. Mm. Then they might do you more damage than good. Um, and so, you know, there's those and then there's ordinary emotions. Anger, the Stoics think are never so good, but I, I dispute some of that. You know, there's righteous indignation that might moral protest that I think is important. Um, and then there are cultivated emotions. You know, emotional intelligence, I think, involves that. That's a new term. That's not their term. But they have ways that we're emotionally intelligent by learning not just lascivious pleasure, but uh, contemplative joy and the pleasure of good deeds and not just get it fast and on your, you know, off where it, it does someone else harm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. So that's one thing that motions much of self grit, you know, one of the lesser read Stoics, Musonius Rufus, a name my husband loves to, to, <laughs> to go around the house saying Musonius Rufus. Um, he was Epictetus's teacher and he had tracks on why women, why girls should study philosophy because they have the same capacity for um, virtue as boys do. Uh, their rational capacities are the same. And then, Thirdly, about kind of another aspect of macho grit, the Stoics were the first really to develop the idea of cosmopolitanism. It's a Greek term, means citizen of the cosmos or global mm -hmm. citizen. And 
And the term came from a predecessor, this very colorful character, Diogenes the Cynic, who, when asked where he was from, said everywhere and nowhere, I'm a citizen of the universe, of the mm -hmm. globe. And the Stoics really developed that, especially Marcus Aurelius in very pithy tracks. But it, he says at nightfall on the Danube during the Germanic campaigns, if you've ever, writing to himself, uh, the meditations or jottings to himself, if you've ever seen a, a, um, limbs of a body separated from the body's trunk, that's what we make of ourselves when we cut ourselves off from each other. Mm. And he uses phrases like we're co-partners and co-workers, even when we're sleepwalkers, we're cooperating together. So, you know, it's a, the cosmos works through divine and human interventions that are very interlocking. Mm. And so he got that idea. Um, and so the idea of emotionless, macho, grit, go it alone without the support of others doesn't really capture what we know about or what the Stoics were putting forth as resilience. Mm. And in that regard, they're close to contemporary psychologists, I think, who really know that if you want to have a resilient child, you that child has to be in a supportive network. And we all know that, um, especially during this pandemic, we know how much we have missed our communities and right. are reaching out to others. So those are, those are the, those are some uh, capsule points. Perfect. And it, I, the plane is just about to land. <laughs> Good. I, I hope it's a smooth landing. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you know what? It really, if it's not, I mean, you would prefer a, a smooth landing, but if it's not, the Stoics would say, well, you know, preferred or not, it's a landing, right? We'll get That's to that true. actually. That's true. Um, Okay, so so ancient philosophy, mostly Greek and Roman, yeah, correct, yeah, okay. yeah. So really coming out of that era and that that uh, two or three hundred years BCE, and then and then uh, all the way through, did it continue to? It sort of. I know there's a resurgence happening today, but do you find a period of time where the Stoics sort of went? They they weren't really as critical to the time period in influencing it as early and now? Great question. So the Stoics were contemporaneous with the Judeo-Christian religion, right? Mm -hmm. So they're, the Roman Empire is um, contemporaneous with the birth of Christianity. Prior to that, of course, Judaism. And so... It, there's a familiarity at the time with Roman thought, and it, it, it sounds familiar to us now, in part because some of it got absorbed into Judeo-Christian yeah, ideas. No doubt. Augustine uh, picked up on some of it, and you know some of the flutters that I was talking about, like the, the quick arousals, the starts and startles that are sort of pre-emotions. He was thinking a lot of that as the sometimes the impulses of sin like you know can you control an erection and uh, yeah. your, your your dreams are they're wet or not you know this may be the workings of the devil or something right. like that right yeah <laughs> that's some have said he's picking that up from uh, a notion in in um uh, ancient thought and in, in particular that seneca develops um called um pro or pro, uh, that's the greek term but um essentially um um, before impulse ad, uh, affects, yeah. there's sort yeah. of early, early proto emotions. Yeah. Philo has terrific. He, Philo of Alexandria, sometimes called Philo Judeus, he's contemporary with Seneca, but he's living, he's exiled from Jerusalem and living in Alexandria. Um, and he talks about these uh, feelings that, uh, like Sarah, Sarah has the feeling that she's, uh, she, she's laughs. She laughs when God says as a centenarian, she's going to have a child. Mm -hmm. It's a nervous laugh. And so he says, it's not a real emotion. You know, she hasn't, it's, it's something else. And that's like these flutters or these yeah. uncontrollable, or Abraham's going to go cry at her grave when she dies. He's about to go says the Bible, and then Philo, who gives you exegesis or, or, you know, commentary on the Bible, on the Old Testament, says, 
she was a he was about to cry he didn't really cry there's a lot of control right like it's right, right. you control your emotions and so that's they're picking up on what we now think are stoic texts because they're they're reading them they're in the air it's the same period of time sure so then it kind of you know gets absorbed a, a, a quite a lot in uh, Renaissance philosophy, Diderot, Erasmus, Montaigne, mm. um, and much later, the founding fathers, Jeff Jefferson um, is reading in Washington, because it's just in the air. Any educated person is going to pick up a small copy. They probably read Latin, and they're going to, it's a nighttime, bedtime reading. They just pick it up, and it's very digestible, just like people are finding some of it, not all, today. In the academic world, it's poo pooed a bit, huh. I have to say. Having, you know, I, I, I trained at Harvard, and it, you know, you kind of weren't reading Stoic philosophy because it was thin, you know, it wasn't deep right. or, sure. or thick. Sure. And the what I mean, you it's were, just way too understandable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were right. reading, you know, but it kind of then they started translating the Greek texts, not the you know, not the Latin ones, which were really complicated and uh -huh. really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. People like Zeno, and you know, they're fragments, but those started coming into where you could teach it. You could teach an anthology with them, and that changed the flavor of academic philosophy. Interesting. But it had all, but it all, it had been picked up in popular philosophy before, but you know you really weren't in the in a classical philosophy, ancient Roman classical philosophy department teaching on the philosophy side of the house as opposed to maybe classics, the Seneca or Cicero. It took a while for that to kind of catch sure. up. Sure. So, so Nancy, one of the things I, I love about your book, but also just love about uh, Stoicism, is that. Uh, there's this sense of deep observation about life. And then the Stoics come up with these interesting ways of dealing with their observations, whether it be anxiety or depression or difficulty. And, I, and, and so we get into some really practical advice that Stoics bring to the table based on living their own life. And I, I suppose, you know, trying things out and seeing, you know, what works and what doesn't. And I want to talk about several of these with you and maybe to frame it. Um, you talk in the book about the stoic idea of preferreds, dispreferreds and indifference. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it seems to me that this is a tremendous fundamental property of stoicism is really how you view what's happening to you and how to then uh, respond to that. And, and, and so could you talk a little bit about this? You, you talk in, in the book, you say um, that there, there are things that we might prefer a, a good over a bad, uh, but, but none of those are actually necessary according to the Stoics, for happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're preferred, but we should also sort of be indifferent to them. What? Yeah, talk sure. a little bit about how they saw that. So they are uh, reacting very hard of, uh, off of Aristotle's ethics. So Aristotle has this view, which is in the Greek world, you know, the slings and arrows of fortune can undo you. Tragedy is part of the Greek inheritance, you mm. know, Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides, that's what they write about, Homer, you know, um, and you could be Priam and lose all your sons in war, right, um, in the Trojan War, uh, and if you do, does, are you, and you're a really good person, does that derail your happiness, or can you still somehow hold on? Mm. So Aristotle says you need some good fortune in order to exercise your virtue, make good on your virtue. If your situation is so cramped and, you know, you're a prisoner of war for years, 20 years, Guantanamo. Um, uh, I interviewed Stockdale, prisoner of war, seven and a half years in, in um, what was called the Hanoi Hilton, the North Vietnamese prisoner of war camp. 
uh, how do you hold on to your good, not, not just your happiness, your flourishing, but your goodness? Yeah. Doesn't it start corrupting or eroding you? So the Aristotle says you need a little bit of good fortune. You know, you a little prosperity, a good regime, a, um, healthy children, uh, friends who all don't predecease you, etc. <laughs> the money. I mean, it's you know, he's very he's very practical. The Stoics think this puts your happiness at risk. Mm -hmm. And so they go back to an older Socratic position of Socrates saying, virtue is sufficient for happiness. Your goodness is sufficient for happiness. So what then, and that's the only real good, and that's one that you should be able to cultivate that's more or less within your power. They don't go into, you know, what if you have horrible parents <laughs> Or you're, you know, or you're born cognitively impaired. You know, they, they just sort of look at the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. But what then of all the things that any person in their right mind would want to have? You want health over disease. You want some money over abject poverty. You know, Socrates might walk barefoot and he might need no clothing in the, you know, like, like, um, you know, Jack Dorsey says, I walk without a, you know, without a coat <laughs> back and forth in at Silicon Valley, mind you. <laughs> right, right. <Pretty> warm. <laughs> um, you might need some clothing. What about all those things? You might not need a hundred years of war. What about all that? So they say, well, you're right. We're going to downgrade them. We're not going to go with Aristotle and say they're all, all goods. We're going to say they're indifference. Better to have them than not better to and they're better to have health over disease that's preferred disease dispreferred but we'll call them the indifference with ts meaning they're not going to make or break your happiness because mm. happiness has not just at its core but and not just as the dominant good but through and through uh a, a virtue yeah. These other things, it's a little like this. I say it's, it's like adding a, a holding a candle in broad sunlight. Does it add much more light? No. If you drop some sugar in a salty sea, will the ocean get sugary? No. They're, they do not make a substantial difference. Mm. That said, they give you many, many ways in which you can think about of a, 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 a be, having fitting behavior, they call it, like um, meat behavior, proper behavior that includes selecting them. And wisdom is actually selecting the preferred goods. It's a, it's not a simple system. It's complicated. It, mm. it, it's selecting these goods, but also if you don't get them, not getting derailed. Yeah. So yeah. they have to then give you methods for not getting derailed. <laughs> sure. so, I mean, the, the power in that is the likelihood of every single indifferent going negative for me is super low. True. Right? And so with that, then uh, the, the power of stoic thought, it seems to me, is that I can be completely derailed by an indifferent I don't get while I have so many that really are preferred. That's true. But then put yourself seven and a half years as a POW, two and a half years in solitary yeah. and tortured. Yeah. Or I was just listening to news about Guantanamo today because, you know, things are different now a little bit with the Taliban ruling Afghanistan and will there be recidivism or not? OK, yep. what well, I was in Guantanamo, Guantanamo was not pretty, uh, the, nor, nor, is te nor is terrorism or anything. But I'm just saying the conditions under which many of those who were there now close to 20 years was pretty crappy. So that's a pretty big dispreferred. It's a pretty, pretty big dispreferred. Right? outbalance some of the others, whatever the reason is that you were there. I'm, that's, that's a moot point. Right. Um, you know, and, and some people do find it hard to rally after if you lose a child, which I have been blessed not to have, but mm -hmm. I have friends that have, um, 
that's a very, very hard one to get yeah. over quickly, quickly. Oh, really. uh -huh. So, all right. So let's just keep sort of unwrapping the uh -huh. ideas here. So uh, there are things to prefer, but I shouldn't prefer them to such a degree that I lose my ability to experience not only happiness, but virtue. Correct. Uh, well, and, and, and happiness really is from virtue. Yeah, the expression of virtue is yeah. really what brings happiness. All these other things, eh, they're preferred, but they're not really going to add to my virtue. Correct. So then uh, the Stoics talk about sort of ways to get in touch with this and and train yourself, I suppose, toward these things. And you talk about one of these um, that you call pre-rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is you say is, I love this phrase, learning to dwell in advance. That's uh, a phrase Cicero uses. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that. I, I like to call that arriving before I arrive. It's but great. It, it's the same <laughs> idea here. And um, don't you say here, the stoic approach to mitigating anxiety is to know the enemy you might be fighting. Don't be caught off guard. Uh, and then you talk about how we could even be applying this now during our, uh, our our current situation with COVID. But can you talk a little bit about so what this idea of pre-rehearsing trouble uh, is is certainly something that goes sort of counterintuitive to a lot of the thinking today. That you know why would you want to rehearse possible negative things that could happen that may never happen? So how would the Stoics that's, respond to that? That's great. And I worried about that myself. Why pre-traumatize yourself? You might, in the extreme case, why expose yourself to risk and tr uh, potential trauma with the possibility that you could be um, um overexposed to these bad things in a certain way. Yes. So they're not thinking so much that as more of a kind of way of being inured or better, but not bulletproof, but um, not fully caught off guard. So they're thinking of mm -hmm. things like, well, death, of course, memento more, think about death. Um, I mean, you could even think about Macbeth. He's always, you know, oh, oh, oh. Like Beth or Hamlet, I can't, I think it's Hamlet. He's always holding, you know, uh, the skull there. Um, and <laughs> um, I was thinking it, uh, uh, of it a little bit in terms of my mom. It was a very yeah. pedestrian example. A powerful part of the book, actually. Yeah. You know, my mom was a non talker, a, a very avid reader, um, but we, you know, barely could get words out of her, a, a one word um, um, responder. And lived a very ripe age uh, and quite happy in her later years. But she never talked about death. And there she was in a nursing home. And, you know, and she's with people in their 90s. One of them was 103, 104. No one talked about death, you know. So at some point, I just said, Mom, you know, if we've got you on the, you know, the long-term plan, like the immortal plan is what I said. <laughs> it's going to be really expensive. Yeah, you know, I knew what I was paying already. And, you know, and I barely mentioned what this was costing us. But I thought, boy, if it's in the... And I got this little cute smile off my mom. She was very beautiful. And I knew I was touching a nerve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that became our dance. You know, we would joke. Did we sign up? Did we sign up for the immortal plan? So that's a, a very, um, well, you know, as in psychotherapy, you always, uh, uh, timing, 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 and figure out a, a language that people can pick up on. That was the way I could talk to my mother to get to her, to dwell in advance, dwell in the future about something that she was viewing kind of to as toxic. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Epictetus has very simple ways of developing this. You begin with what's pretty trivial, breaking a piece of pottery that you really like. Rehearse it. 
will it be so bad when it happens? And, you know, I'm, I'm in that boat because I like pottery. And if, you know, if, if I or my husband broke one of our favorite pots, I got to get pissed off. But I used to think a little bit about it. How, what big a deal is that? Um, he talks about all the pickpockets and jostlers and people making noise at the public, at the baths in Rome. Yeah. Well, I like to go swimming a whole lot and I don't like it when all the, you know, young high school girls are out in the locker room screaming in French, you know, <laughs> which is what they do. And me trying to figure out what they're saying, but their French is too fast and idiomatic. So I can't follow. So I would think I'm not going to get pissed off at the girls when they're, you know, chattering away. Those are um, very mundane ways of maybe Tim Ferriss calls it fear setting, thinking about what are the risks you're going to face, how you're going to mitigate it, and if it's not, how to make it not so bad. It's a kind of meditation. Yeah. And, and, then, and then to sort of work your way up to things that might cause you more angst to think about, I suppose the ultimate one, maybe for most of us, certainly me, would be death. Uh, and I, I want to go back to death for just a minute. You write, I think it's in the same area as you're talking about your time with your mom and the immortal plan, which I thought was a brilliant way to bring that up. <laughs> um, but you say the Stoics famously meditate on facing death through the rehearsal of the fact of our mortality, which I mean, is just all over the Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. ethic as well. Is, right. You know, numbering your days um, not being, you know, sort of arrogant about what you're going to do tomorrow, uh, so to speak. And you say their mantras are not about defying death, but facing it with equanimity. Uh, and, and therefore the, the practice of memento mori, keeping death in mind. Um, have you heard of the, the, the app We Croak? I, I think I have it. Help me out. <laughs> Yeah, so I I don't I, I death is one for me that um, I think particularly because of how I grew up, uh, you know, in a, in a sort of evangelical fundamentalist Christian home. I've left that, but I still have these uh, residue points of I really would like to live forever, but I'm quite certain that is not going to happen now. So I'm I'm always trying to, you know, sort of memento mori. And so this app called We Croak mm -hmm. uh, sends you five messages a day. And, and the message just starts out, this is just a reminder, you're going to die. <laughs> and then if you click on it, it, it reads you a quote about death or about life or something uh -huh. like that. And I'll just be going along in my day and I'll feel it buzz in on my phone and I'll, I'll look down and it'll just say, this is just a reminder, you're going to die. And it sort of reminds me of, of what you're talking about here in a pre-rehearsal, that these things that potentially are going to happen or ultimately are going to happen, like death, are actually not morbid to think about, but help me develop this sense, I like how you said it, to not be caught off guard. Right. So I've often thought that death for the person experiencing it is much, much easier than death for survivors. I mean, I think that's just mm -hmm. a very common reaction. So I myself don't fear death, but of course, I, 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 I uh, the horror if you're a parent is... Um, your children predeceasing you and it coming suddenly without your having time to prepare. So in a certain way, the Stoics are giving you time to prepare or at least encouraging you to take time to prepare for things that don't, that, that you would rather avoid. They also give you a sense. Um, I mean, I was reading studies from the Israeli Defense Force at some point because a, a friend who's a psychiatrist had put me onto this, um, who studies this, who had said there's, sort of attention biasing, you know, the, the, there are studies where you attend to, um, this is for PTS, that you attend to stuff that's very frightening. In min this, is in, this is subliminal, um, so that you can 
get a bit, de you can destigmatize it a little bit. Your brain can, can also flip between it and more um, uh, neutral uh, stimuli. Mm -hmm. and it, it loses some of its toxicity. I guess the other thing to say in this, the Stoics are thinking about fear because they do view um, uh, the kind of very robust responses we have to fear, which is part of our animal nature, I think, mm -hmm. as very, uh, can be crippling. Um, or similarly, anger. <clears throat> you know, so they think about fear, anger, desire as three emotions that, and all their permutations, all the various variety, the subspecies of them as things that um, can derail you. But I study moral injury a lot, um, which is not just, which is complex PTS. It's complex um, responses that have to do with more shattered identity um, mm. because you're disempowered morally or you're betrayed or you can't do what you'd like to do, what you think is right because the structures just aren't there. Think of all the Think of everyone who's coming out of Afghanistan that felt hemmed and hawed because they're dealing with corrupt warlords or Afghani troops that knew that they there was there was no one to answer to. Mm -hmm. um, but whereas the tribes, the tribals knew there was someone, you know, you get saved or something like that. Mm -hmm. So all of those people, I think of all the veterans, I've worked with hundreds over the years uh, who are experiencing that. That's a kind of moral injury. Fear setting and destigmatizing, you know, and fear conditioning, which is what the Stoics are kind of onto a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's not going to help you with that. These are in these are incursions on your moral agency. Yes, and I think that's a place where they're a little weak. I have to say, you know, the will can only take you so far. Mm -hmm. The strength strength of will only gets you so far if you're in a dysfunctional system. Yes. Or a system that doesn't support your will and your your good deeds, no matter how much you try to exercise them, you know, you need a hospitable environment <laughs> for yeah. uptake. And yeah. I think that you know they're they're naive about that. And yeah. part of it is because they they knew their environment, you know, Seneca's writing under Nero, he's in that court, you know, you you make the best of a bad world <laughs> or you get you get into power yourself. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So here's another one in er, later in the book. I think it's in the second to the last chapter. You call it the art of stoic living mm -hmm. and you juxtapose, uh, juxtapose a, 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 an Eastern type of meditation with a yep. Western with, with, with the stoic idea of meditation. Mm -hmm. And the idea there being that, you know, an Eastern uh, whether it's a Buddhist meditation, or I know you talk about a, in the book a meditation you do. Is it from the Taoist tradition? You know, I think it's more Vedic. It's it, yeah, you know, from the Vedic tradition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you have these um, Eastern ways of meditating that are really about teaching me about the nature of my mind and and that I am not my thoughts. And mm -hmm. and if I wanted to go down the whole world of dualism versus non-dualism and Am I just a constructed self? And all of that, that, that takes you down that road. But then you, you sort of juxtapose that to a stoic type of meditation that is really not about necessarily disidentifying with your thoughts, but actually using your mind to meditate on your day and, to, you know, the Stoics were famous for doing this at night mm -hmm. and really almost it almost seems almost like a, a form of contemplation about your day that readies you and um, gives you a sense of how you could do better tomorrow. Can you talk about that? Sure. So Eastern meditation really is kind of quieting the babble. That's how I, I mean, that's, that's very um, cheap and, and quick, but that's a way of, um, of, of thinking about it. Uh, you're really stopping the, dis the discourse for a while and all of the sentences and, you know, and self-litigation and that kind of stuff. 
um, in order to really find a different kind of calm and a different kind of consciousness, which I do think you can find through um, various forms of Eastern meditation, especially if you're very practiced at this and go on retreats and the like. Mm -hmm. Stoic meditation is really much more in, although no surprise, it's the Western tradition, and it's much closer to, you know, what Freud was picking up on as a, you know, a 19th, 20th century um, psychologist of the mind. And that is, you're, you're, you're thinking about yourself very, discur very discursively through language, uh, chatter. But for the Stoics, unlike someone like Freud or a lot of psychotherapy, it's okay to beat up on yourself. I'm sorry. To, I mean, <laughs> that's the overstatement. But it is about moral edification. It's about making yourself better. And if it requires some shaming <laughs> and being tough on yourself, it's okay. Sure. Because you are your moral counselor. You are working on yourself. So Seneca says, you know, was I, was I too rough with my servant today um, when they broke the glass goblet? Did I get a bit uppity when they didn't put me at the dais next table next to the people of honor. I was stuck in the back of the room at the banquet. I mean, did the, did the guard at the door not recognize me and let me into the party? I mean, these are pretty pedestrian events, yeah. but they, you know, that's where, was I dissed? Was yeah. I in? But they can still push you into preferring something that really is not worth preferring. Absolutely. So he's, really thinking about the trivia of the day and where they have taken you in the wrong direction. So it's very much about moral enhancement. It's about becoming a better person. It's not about quieting your mind. Yeah. I mean, you can say there was a you know funny Steve, I, I said to, in the, in the, I think the beginning of the chapter, Steve Martin was reaching out to, um, just lost his name. The uh, comedian. Reiner. Um, yeah, Carl Reiner. Reiner. Yeah. yeah, sort of saying, "Did I? Am I? Am I keep? Are you awake? Am I keeping you up?" He says, "No, I'm just thinking about you know all everything I did wrong today." <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know that's a little like stoic meditation. It could keep you awake, or it could prep you in the way much diary writing would set you up for more resolve in the next day. And I think we often do do that. You know, sure. we resolve to, 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 to be, to do better. To, you know, if you're a parent, you're always thinking about, did yeah. I overstep this? Yeah. Could I have said it differently so that the door didn't slam or, you know, or we had a better conversation on the phone, that kind of thing. I mean, in a sense, it is a form of journaling. And I mean, Marcus Aurelius really was journaling just to yeah. himself. Correct. So there's there is some kind of reflective practice going on here. About, oh, very much so. Mm, yeah, about it, is, my life. it is an early practice of journaling. I mean, he was really. It, it reads notes to you know um, wrote notes to myself. It became the meditations much later in the published world, um, and they're very humbling. You know, he's. He's his emperor. I think I once saw a, a remake of the gold effigy that would be rolled out on the battlefield. I mean, this is a larger than life would be wrong. You know, that barely describes this. And yet he was trying to reform himself. And Seneca is writing letters to a young civil servant named Lucilius, but he's also writing to himself in his final years about what could he have done better? Um, how does, uh, what, what does a good life look like? Um, who are the friends that he would like to have? You know, and some of it is also mercy. He's telling later another essay, Mercy on Mercy, of course, to Nero um, to show mercy, but also to yourself, I think, to show a little compassion to yourself when you're overly um, yeah. harsh and, yeah. over, you know, you beat up on yourself too much. You have 10 more minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, I have several more things I'd love to talk about, but I know we have time is of the essence here. Um, and and I, I, I just want to point out a few things because I, I really do want to talk about your time uh, interviewing 
uh, James Stockdale and your work in the military. And it's just a fascinating part of your story. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit about it. But I do just want to say you're, the whole chapter on life hacks uh, is quite powerful. And I would just suggest to people that they take some time to really think about that. Because I think there's something about the way we present things today that can really cheapen them by calling them a life hack in one sense, because it takes it away from this lived philosophy that the life hack is coming out of. Right. Um, but at the same time, these are powerful tools that can make a difference in any moment of my life. So I just want to highlight that, that I thought that was a, the way you handled that idea of life hacks Thank you. Uh, in the book was quite uh, wonderful. And then this idea here, and maybe this can get us into talking about your time in the military, but you, you talk about, uh, I don't know if you say it exactly like this, but that what Stoic wisdom also is trying to help us do is adapt in any moment to the changing nature of the moment. Yes. and not get so attached to it, knowing that it's impermanent. And you say here, um, the sage's impulse align with the present epistemic landscape. The sage doesn't assent to future wished for contingents. He keeps updating impulses in light of updated beliefs. Oh, I love that. In short, the sage doesn't get stuck on what's wished for or what was. Motive always tracks cognitive changes and cognitive agility guarantees keeping up. Oh, Nancy, that's just brilliant. What page, um, what page did she write that? <laughs> I don't know exactly what page that is because I read it on a Kindle. Um, uh, you're right. <laughs> but it's... Um, I think that captures a lot of, um, now they're thinking about someone who has, um, you know, perfect omniscience. So this person, the sage, uh, the omniscient, uh, can keep up with all these changes. But we get stuck, you know, future, past earnings don't predict future earnings, right? I had that in mind all the time, the, the top of the brochure from your Vanguard or Fidelity report. <laughs> <laughs> and... That's sort of what they were thinking. It's very, you know, I'm not, they weren't timers, market timers, but they were thinking that you can't get stuck. And the way you get stuck is typically, we all do. Our emotions are, are give us sticky attachments. Yes. Can't imagine moving out of this house. I can't imagine a summer without my garden. I can't imagine leaving this or that. I mean, so we, we get stuck. Um, I think Freud called it cathexis. It means holding on to, uh, it was yeah. sort of the Greek, but and he, the German bezoitzung, I'm stuck on it, possessing it. And that's what they're talking about. It's a sticky attachment. And if you had adapt this um, more fluid adaptiveness, you could pivot left and right. And I admire people I mean, I admire people who have to start their lives over, who we, we live with these. I mean, I think of immigrants right now, refugees. Many of us are not that many generations away from displacement um, and what you'd have to do to learn a whole new life, a new language. I, I teach these students, you know, at George, yeah. we have lar yeah. large people, large groups of people who's for whom they're, this is the first time ever they step foot in the United States. And Nancy, just a bit of first person here. You, yeah. you talk about uh, you were the first person to come in and teach um, ethics after the the a, a scandal that had occurred at the uh, the military Naval yeah, the yeah. Naval Academy, and um, so much work with the military. And, and in fact, you had written a book on military stoicism earlier. Mm -hmm. But just just your from your own perspective, um, that time and, and if you continue to do that, talk about several stories about working with military uh, and and what it taught you and how it relates to stoicism. But I'm just curious from your own just your own experience, what what has that taught you? That the time you spent teaching cadets or midshipmen, I guess, is the right. The right way to say it, uh, and and the time you spent 
interviewing uh, veterans and working with veterans, I, I just love to hear a little bit about how so, that shaped you. Oh, it shaped me enormously. Um, uh, on the personal side, I'm you know I grew up during the, um, the 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 period of mayhem during the Vietnam War um, on a Quaker campus, um, Bryn Mawr Haverford. So, um, and uh, with draft deferments and enormous protests. It was just a, a tumultuous time. Hmm. Um, fast forward 30 years, roughly, from the mid 60s to the mid 90s, I get called up by the Naval Academy. My dad is a veteran of uh, an army medic, um, now deceased, but um, so I grew up with the military in my background, but it wasn't talked about much. And uh, World War II was very different from Vietnam on his view. So there I was with admirals, colonel, marine colonels, marine generals who had fought in Vietnam mm. when I had been protesting in Viet mm. uh, Vietnam War. It was powerful. They were flying these flights, you know, or in, in boats in the Mekong Delta. It really was powerful. And then I and ended up interviewing several times and actually giving lectures in his honor, Jim Stockdale, yeah. complicated figure because of the Gulf of Tonkin um, to listeners can research that. Um, but he um, had somehow been given Epictetus's small handbook and memorized it. And it was salvation for him. It mm. was his survival kit. And, so, and the military, some of them knew it, the naval community kind of knew it. So they resonated with it when I came in to teach. They had been teaching ethics, but they didn't have a brigade wide course. And um, uh, stoicism was their philosophy. I mean, no surprise, it's a military ethic of this sure. But I was surprised, I was naive in many ways, but it, it shaped my time in the military and I still continue, I'm very involved with consulting for the military and, and um, I was on suicide review boards and work with the, all the academies. Um, and, and train PhD students who are colonels and, and higher. It, you know, we divide worlds into this and that component. And, uh, and when you're not, it's not, it's not a conscription military, but only a half percent serve. Many of us do not know well those who have served. And if you're from the Maryland corridor and you're not from the South or the Midwest, where there have been huge um, uh, draft, or, or, you know, conscriptions, mm. not conscriptions, but signups and encouragements to enlist because um, if it's a way out, a way to earn some money and the like, as well as a, a very a robust sense of patriotism mm -hmm. post 9-11. Um, you don't get it. It's a, you know, as my military folks would say, you know, we were, we were, we were deployed when you were, shopping at the mall, you know, what were you doing? That kind of thing. And some of them have been in seven, eight, nine deployments. That's a lot of deployments with all of the moral injury that comes with, was the war worth it? Collateral incidents. That was a kid who was carrying a toy, but I thought it was, she was fiddling with an IED and improvised explosive device. Mm -hmm. Or the phone was really a phone, but I was sure it was going to set off a bomb. I mean, there's a lot of hindsight bias, which brings mm. survival guilt, which brings a sense of moral paralysis, mm. a shattered sense. And so I often, and in the new book, I really think hard about the clash of stoicism with moral injury, moral identity crises, mm. and can stoicism handle it? Can stoicism accommodate? I think it can. I think there, I, I argue that there's places, there are places in Seneca's plays, you know, not everyone wants to include them as real Seneca. I think they are, or as um, part of the corpus, but they're really quite fascinating hmm. where he's talking about, I, I did horrible things, says Heracles. He comes out of the nether world and then he can, uh, and he's duped by his stepmother, Gino, and he kills his family and he wants to commit suicide. Um, and at that moment, at least his father and closest friends said, the deed wasn't yours. It was mm. your stepmother's. Mm. 
use your heroic courage to stay your hand. And so it's a looking through the eyes of a compassionate friend with, who will be your support and, uh, and sort of rock or your resilience source and be compassionate to yourself. Don't beat up on yourself so hard because that that's what a lot of people do feel. So I'd say, it, A, it's humbling. I, um, I think one of the most, what's on my mind right now is one of my beloved students is named um, Thomas Gibbons Neff. He is the Pentagon cons correspondent who was in Kabul just recently, and he's been evacuating people out. And he was mm -hmm. all, the all the times the post Washington Post, the journal all got together to get their people on or they're working on it. And as an ex former Marine, he was very involved. He's been very involved in the evacuation. I don't know if he still is, but that's what I've been hearing. And he had come to me just fresh out of the helm, out of the Helmand process of uh, province, um, having lost three buddies. He's a mm -hmm. former sniper and what it felt like. And, various incidents with the Taliban. I mean, I know them very intimately. He was mm -hmm. in class on just war ethics and thinking about the moral psychology of war. And then, and now 13 years after, 14 years after his time there, he's writing about it with, I mean, he's way too old for his young self. Mm -hmm. You know, he was an 18 year old, seven, 18 year old. And, and, um, you know, and he's been through a whole lot. And so I, I, I often see the what I read through the eyes of those that I've talked to and think about they're very, they're Marines, they're tough, they're strong, they're unflappable, they're, you know, bulletproof, all of that, but they're not. You know, right. stoicism leaves room, has to leave room to heal after being really injured, not just in body, but you know, and your ideals and what, yeah. you, what you think you were doing or what we all, you know, or how you might've been betrayed. If you, I, this morning I was listening to David Armitage speak. He was the deputy secretary of state um, under the under um, Bush. And I think I sat next to him actually at an event with, that was honoring Stockdale. So I'm just remembering that as I speak. Um, and we were chatting and, you know, and he said, I bear on my conscience what, some of the things that I let go because there was there was too much about the Iraq war in my inbox. Just to give you that, yeah. <laughs> sure, not boots on the ground, but the pedestrian matters of life um, nice. when you're in bureaucracy. And anyway, so I've worked very closely. That's a long-winded way of saying I've worked very closely with the military. I continue to work closely with the military. And when I write about stoicism, sometimes it's with them in mind, but I think they have lessons for all of us because yeah. – you know, we're all in some in, in conflicts of some sort or other, yeah. our, own, our own making or uh, or geopolitical. Nancy, um, in closing, do you have a favorite Stoic quote? Oh my! Okay, <laughs> or at least a top five one at one in the top five. Yeah, I, I think I have to go back to Marcus Aurelius. Um, um, picture a dismembered hand or foot on a battlefield. That's what you make of yourself when you cut yourself off from each other. Mm. I think that captures it. And maybe one other, at the very end of On Anger, Seneca's um, essay, he says, let us cultivate humanity. And so I think that's a very stoic message. Yeah. Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. It's been a real pleasure. It's yeah, been absolutely been a pleasure and I can't recommend your book enough. We'll be uh, getting it, uh, your information on where to get it out to people. And I really encourage people to get it and read it and, and uh, not just a cursory read, but let it really sink, sink in. So um, thank you for, for the labor of writing it. Uh, it was a labor of love. Yeah, it was a absolutely. labor of love. Yeah. Again, thank, thank you, you very much for a lovely interview. Appreciate it very much. Bye-bye, Dave.